All right, now I'm awake. All right, there's the lights. All right. So this morning, we're going to be talking about one word, and that word is promises. So just shout out real quick. Uh, when you hear that word, what comes to your mind? What's a promise? A guarantee? Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Somebody said something over here. Oh, a declaration? Hope? Oath? Okay, yeah, oath. So those are all good good, good uh, definitions of promise. So it's, it's basically like a promise is something that you can take to the bank, right? Like you know it's going to be fulfilled. Either you promise to do something or promise not to do something. And so when you do that, the person you're promising it to expects that you're going to keep it, right? So, so that's what a promise is. So we're going to talk about promises today. And sometimes promises are fulfilled and sometimes promises are broken. So when there's a fulfilled promise, that you could say, I think we would all agree, it builds confidence and trust, right? But a promise that's not kept, a promise that's broken, it, it breaks that confidence and trust. So I remember when I was a teenager, which seems like a long time ago. I know some of you got me beaten age, but it still feels like a long time ago because uh, I'll be 40, 39, 40, yeah, 40, 40 this month. So this was like 20 years ago. Um, actually, it was probably 22 years ago because I was 18. I'm much more mature now than I was then. That wasn't supposed to be funny. So that just shows you how immature I was then. So I'm much more mature now. No. So, it, yeah, I, I had a lot of growing up to do, still do, but I had a lot of growing up to do back then. So I was about 18, just graduated high school, and enrolled in college. I was, in a, I was going to a community college in Forest City called um, East Arkansas Community College. So I was just going to go there, get my basics. Didn't really know what uh, after that, but I was going to go get my basics. All right, I was going to go there for two years. I had a scholarship there, which that's what makes it worse the rest of the story here. So I was going to get my school, uh, my basics, and if you went from high school to college, you know you know what I'm talking about when I say this. In high school, there it's like structure. Like I mean, I know you could skip school in high school, but it's a little bit harder to do it. Your classes, once you get to school in high school, you're there, right? I mean, you could choose to leave, I guess, and get wrote up or put in study hall for skipping, but when, once you're in high school, once you're there, once the bell rings, you're there. There's no breaks, right? But in college, it's different. Your, your courses or your classes are spread out. Like, you may have one class that starts at 8 o'clock, and you might not have your next class till 11. So that's kind of how my schedule was when I was in college. I went straight from high school where, like, you're at home. I was living at home. My parents would make sure I'm up. I have to go to school. Didn't get out of school until the bell rang and then came home. So there was a lot of structure. So then I go to college, and there's not near as much structure. Um, so I, it's a little bit more independence which requires a little bit more discipline. So my first course, well, my first class was at 8 a.m. My second class didn't start until like 10.30 or something. So there was like about an hour, hour and 15 minutes in between the time we left class until the time the next class was going to start. So a group of us, we would go to this chicken restaurant in Forest City called Mrs. Winters. Has anybody ever heard of Mrs. Winters? No, okay. All right, we have a few people who've heard they have the best chicken biscuits. I'm not kidding. So we would go there. I, it was every single day. I mean, every day we would go there for these chicken biscuits. I know y'all are hungry now. So we'd go and we'd get some chicken biscuits. And it didn't start out this way at first because we would leave. We'd go to Mrs. Winters, and then we'd go back to school, to college. And it didn't start out this way at first. So after a few times doing that, we had this bright idea of let's just not go back to class. So we would go to our first class, go to Mrs. Winters, get our chicken biscuits, our belly's full. It's, it's nap time. So I'd go back home. I would take a nap, and I would miss that next class. I would go back for the third one, but I would miss that second class. Well, if you know anything about college, you're not supposed to do that. Right? They uh, frown on that to the point where if you do that six times, you fail that class with an incomplete. And that's what happened to me. I failed that class with incomplete. I had an A in it, but if you're not there, they kind of frown upon that. So my parents got wind of it, 
and I got grounded, of course. And then I didn't miss class anymore after that. <laughs> In fact, I don't think I missed, missed, missed Mrs. Winters for a while either, because it was Mrs. Winters' fault is really what it was. Her chicken biscuits were too good. So, yeah, I got grounded. And so there for a period of time, I mean, prior to that, my parents could trust me. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. I was going to school. But then after that happened, there was this period of I had to earn and build that trust back up. I had to regain their trust. Remember, I said broken promise uh, will break confidence and trust, and that's what was going on with them, with my parents, because I had broken that. And I know none of us here in this room have broken promises, right? I know none of us have ever had promises broken to us, right? No, I think we would all, if we're honest, we would say that we have, at some point, we've broken a promise, or if, we, if we're honest, we'd say that there's been somebody who's not kept the promise to us. Well, there's one person, there is one person that you know and I know who has never and never will break a promise. Who is that? Right, Jesus, God. God keeps his word. If he says it, it's going to happen. You know the phrase, you could take it to the bank? Oh, that's what's going on here. God says it, it's going to happen. And so the story we're going to look at today, even though you and I have broken promises, God has not. But sometimes... Just like we're going to look at the character here in Moses, sometimes I think we get in these seasons of our life where even though God has showed himself to us, even though he's proven himself that he's going to be there for us, sometimes we go through these moments where we question God. I know that's none of us here. I know we've never done that, right? I know I've never done that. I've never questioned God or had doubted God. No. No. Uh, if we're all honest, again, we all would say, yes, we've had these moments in our life. Some of you may be having that right now, where you're waiting on God to show you something, you're waiting on God to do something, and frankly, it's just not happening, or frankly, he's just not revealing it to you right now, and you are starting to doubt. You are starting to question God, you are starting to doubt him, your belief has been shaken, because... Something that you think should happen or not happen is not happening. And I think what happens is when we do this, when we approach it this way, we, we handicap ourselves to putting God in this box of wanting him to show us things that, frankly, we don't see in Scripture. So we'll look into this here in a little bit, but this is what's going on with Moses. Moses has forgotten some things. We talked last week about all the excuses that he's given, but this week we're talking about the promises, and Moses needs to be reminded of some things. He has forgotten some things about God, and I think that happens with us, right? I really believe that happens, that sometimes we forget things about God, and we need to be reminded. And that's what's taking place here with Moses. So what's going on here is God has said he's going to deliver the Israelite people out of Egypt. He's going to deliver them and Moses is going to be an integral part in this. So there's this back and forth. God sends Moses to Pharaoh. It doesn't happen. Moses comes back to God. God sends Moses to Pharaoh. It doesn't happen. Moses comes back to God. It keeps going and going and going like this to the point where God sent Moses to Pharaoh. Pharaoh gets angry, and he increases the workload on the Israelites. They're slaves, all right? The Israelites are slaves to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And Moses is going trying to get Pharaoh to release his people. To the point where the last one goes, where Moses wants the Israelite people to be released for this three-day weekend in the wilderness where they're going to have this big, big, uh, big retreat, basically. And, and Pharaoh's like, no, they're not getting this three-day weekend. No. And so Pharaoh gets angry, and he increases the workload on the Israelite people. They were building things. So they, were having, they had straw and bricks and so the straw and the bricks were provided to them. Well, when Pharaoh gets angry, he says, all right, you have to get your own straw. So now, guess what? The Israelites are angry at Moses. Moses, if you would have just kept your mouth shut, this wouldn't be happening. And so there's this back and forth. It's almost like a setup, all right? I feel like sometimes God sets us up to show himself off, right? But only God could do that because he's God. 
So I think that's what was going on here. That's how I feel. Like, he would go back and it'd make worse. Go back and it would make it worse. To the point where the climax is going to happen that we're going to see actually next week, and we'll see a little bit today, of God doing something that is so amazing and so miraculous that it can only be God. So there's this back and forth, and Moses starts questioning things. He, he starts forgetting things. So God is in a place here where he's reminding Moses of some things. So we're going to pick up right there in uh, Exodus chapter 6. For, um, Exodus chapter 6. And if you, have, uh, if you don't have a Bible, that white or blue Bible in front of you, that is yours. That's our gift to you. But if you have a Bible or the white or blue Bible, if you'll turn to Exodus chapter 6, and in that white or blue Bible, it's on page 28. Because I really want everybody to open your Bible. I want you to, if, or if you have a smart, if you have a device or something like that, that's fine too. I really want us to see this. I want the words to jump off the page to show us something that's happening with the Israelites that actually has happened to us that we can take with us from this place. So Exodus chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, page 28 in your white or blue Bible. So here we go. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. So I'm going to pause right there real quick. Throughout this whole passage, we're going to look at the first nine verses. We see this countless times. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. It's almost like God's reminding him, okay, what I just told you either happened or it's going to happen because I am God. All right, so pick up. So verse 3. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with the outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. Verse 7. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So what you see here is, have you ever been in this place where like somebody doesn't really trust you or or believe that you're going to do what you say and you have to remind them what you did for them yesterday like okay i'm going to clean the kitchen abby because yesterday i did it right sometimes that happens sometimes it doesn't i'm gonna do the dishes and i because i did them yesterday but if i had not done them yesterday she may not believe that i'm going to do them today so God is reminding Moses of some things that he has already done before he promises some other things. So let's look at these. God reminds Moses of four things. Four things God reminds Moses of. The first one, he says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, in verse 3, as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make it myself known to them. In other words, that verse right there means that God had appeared to them, he had shown himself, but not in a intimate, personal way like he did like we saw last week with the burning bush with Moses. But God had appeared to these people. He was there. He showed himself. That's the first reminder. The second reminder that we see in verse 4, he says that he established his covenant with them. In other words, God had promised some things. God had promised some things to the Israelite people, to these patriarchs who were who were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their families, and their, all the generations that came after them, he promised that they would have their own land. You know what about a covenant? And that's what we're talking about. That's what a, co a promise is, a covenant. You, you, you covenant to do something. In this case, the covenant and the promise we're talking about is all on God. It doesn't have anything to do with the Israelites. Yeah, these are the people he's promising it to, but it's on him. It's on God. He is the one who established this covenant. So he reminded him, he appeared to them, he established his covenant. And the third thing he reminds Moses of in verse, um, in verse 5, he says, 
I have heard the groaning of the people. I have heard the groaning of the people. Don't, you don't have to turn, but Ephesians chapter 2, verse 24 says the same thing. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant. In other words, these Israelite people are slaves, all right? and they are tired of being slaves. They want to be free. And God is reminding Moses, I hear you. I heard you. Talk about a personal and intimate God. Yeah, we have a powerful God who shows off himself all the time. But this shows and puts on display God's personal side. He hears these things that are weighing them down. And just a quick sidebar, he hears you too. You're here today and you're weighed down by something. And God hears you. So he appeared, he established, he heard. And then the last thing that God reminds Moses of is that he remembered it says in verse, at the end of verse 5, he says, I have remembered my covenant. Moses, I remembered this covenant because I forgot it. I got amnesia and I remembered it because I, I forgot it. It was in the back of my mind and now I remember it. You think that's what God is saying? No, that is not what he's saying. Now, when me and you say that, we say I remembered something. Oh, I remembered to do that, which means if I said I remembered, that means at some point I forgot it. Right, husbands in the room, we do this all the time. Oh, I remembered our anniversary. That means that you probably forgot it, and now you got something that jogged your memory. I remembered your birthday, which means you probably forgot it, and now something jogged your memory. It was in the back of your mind, now it's in the front of your mind, probably because she told you. But God is saying here in this moment, he said, I remember my covenant. So if that's not what it means, if God is not saying, I forgot it, now I remember it, what is he saying? So what he is saying here, anytime you see this word, I remember this is what it's saying. I have or I'm about to act on your behalf. So whenever you see God say, I remember, it means that he is going to act on behalf of a person or a people. In this case, he's telling Moses, I remember the covenant I established with you. Therefore, I am about to act on your behalf. The same thing with us. And we'll look at this in a moment. We'll make this real personal. The same thing with us. When we say that about our lives, when we say God remembered his promise he made to us, we're saying, he's saying, I have and I'm going to act on your behalf. So Moses needed these reminders, just like you and me need these reminders sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes we have to look back to look forward. Sometimes we have to see what God did back here to believe and see and trust what he's going to do in front of us. God doesn't have to prove himself to us, and he didn't have to prove himself to the Israelites because he's God. But you know what's pretty cool? He does it over and over and over again, and we see it all throughout Scripture. And this leads to the promises that God is about to make to Moses. So let's go through these. Verse 6, it says that God, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from the slavery to them. God is promising them that they, he will bring freedom to them that they will no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. And in verse 7, it says that, or at the end of verse 6, it says that he will redeem them with an outstretched arm and the great acts of judgment. He is promising them that he is going to liberate them. They will no longer be under the weight and the burden of being a slave to the Egyptians. And then in verse 7, if you'll look with me, it says that he will take them to be his people. I will take you to be my people. He's promising them that he is going to adopt them into his family. And then the last one it says is inheritance. Moses, in verse 8, it says, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham. In other words, this is God's land. He's promised it to the Israelites, and he's going to give it to them. So these are the promises that God has made to Moses. And it, so what does that have to do with us? So you may be asking that question like, this was thousands of years ago. What does that have to do with us? These are promises that God has made to his people, Israelites. If these promises are this grand and this magnificent, how much greater do you think the promises that you and I have because of Christ? If God's promises to the Israelites are this great, how much greater are Christ's promises to you and to me. And guess what? It's the same ones. 
So what I want you to do is in your water bottle, I'll give you the pages, but I really, it's not going to be on the screen. I want you to see this with your own two eyes. Not me reading it, even though I will, but I want you to follow along with me because we're going to look at these four promises. And we're going to look at God, what he says that he has promised us, just like he promised Moses and the Israelites. Because I'm convinced, because I've been there too, I'm convinced that you and I, we want to be promised something that's not all the time in Scripture. Not always in Scripture. You have cancer, and you want to be healed of that. I can't find anywhere in Scripture that you'll be healed of cancer in this life. You want that job promotion at work. I can't find anywhere in Scripture that you promise that job promotion. You want to stop struggling in your marriage. You want to stop going through this or going through that. You want to stop going through trials and tribulations. You want to stop feeling bad. I can't promise you any of that, and you can't either because it's nowhere in Scripture. And I think that's what happens to you and I. We set ourselves up for failure and disappointment and discouragement because we go to God and we pray for something, and we don't see it come to fruition. We don't see it happen. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. So how do we attack this? How do we, how do we approach this? How can we eliminate this discouragement when we face problems and we're looking to promises that are nowhere to be found in Scripture. You know how we do that? We look at the promises that are. We look to the promises that we have here. You may not be promised that you're going to be healed of cancer in this life, but you will be promised that you'll be healed of cancer in the next life, and you will be promised that God will be with you. Same thing with other things, your job promotion, whatever it might be. You might not be promised that in this life, but you are promised that God is with you. You are promised that he has given you a new life in Jesus Christ. So what if, instead of focusing on the things that we can't see anywhere in Scripture that were promised, what if we were just to focus on the things that we are promised? I am convinced that it would change us completely. I am convinced that it would change us completely because then we wouldn't be discouraged about something that didn't happen. Instead, we would be so encouraged of the things that we know to be true. And that's what's going on with Moses here. He's so discouraged, and he needs to be reminded, and God had to show him what he's promising him because they're facing problems, and instead of focusing on the promises that God had made them, he was focusing on the problems at hand. And I think if we're honest, that's you and I. So we're going to look at these promises. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And if you have the Water Blue Bible, it's on page 476. So, we're going to go through these. God promised Moses and the Israelites these four things that you and I have been promised by Jesus. So, the promises to the Israelites, these are the promises to you and to me. So, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. I'm, hopefully, everybody's got it there. I mean, uh, yeah, 28 through 30. Page 476. So it says this. This is Jesus talking. So these are the red letters. See the red letters? You pay attention. I mean, you pay attention to all of them. But these are the red letters. These are, this is Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God promised Moses and the Israelites freedom to no longer be slaves. Jesus has promised you and me freedom to no longer have to be slaves to sin. The picture is this, that verse that we just read. The picture is this. You have two oxen. You have two animals. And they're joined in this wooden frame, right? And they're plowing the field. And you have a weak oxen, and then you've got a strong oxen. The weak oxen is getting to reap and benefit what the strong oxen is doing, not because of anything it's doing, but because it's simply joined in with the strong oxen. That's you and me when we join into Christ. We get to reap what Jesus has done. We get to reap what he's going to do, not because of you and me, because we're the weak one. He's the strong one. But when we join into Christ, we get to be a part of what he's doing. We get to plow that field, so to speak. But not because of us. We're weak. He's strong. I remember when I was 
in my youth group, which was a long time ago again, I can't swim. I, I sink like a bird in a, a rock in a bird's bath. So y'all have heard me share these stories. But anyway, so we were in uh, Destin, Florida. So we were out in the Gulf. And my youth pastor decided he wanted to take me out there. This can't go wrong. So let's go out into the ocean, the Gulf, Marty. Let's go. I'll, I'll get somebody with you. So we did that. It was horrible. I hated it. I did not have fun at all. I got my youth pastor right here and my friend right here. And if they just let go of me, I'm drowning. I mean, I'm just going to drown. I hated it. I did not want to do it again. So you know what I did? When we got back to shore, I went to the store, and I bought a life jacket. I don't need you. I didn't trust you out there. I don't need you. So I put the life jacket on and went out to the Gulf by myself, and they look up, and I'm way, I mean, way out. Like, I'm floating. And it was awesome. I loved it. Why? I had that life jacket on. When I put that life jacket on, I had this freedom that I didn't have before. When you and I put Christ on us, we have this freedom and this confidence that we could tackle the world ahead of us. It makes us want to punch the devil in the face. Because we're wearing Christ. That's the freedom that we're talking about here. The second promise that he gives us is redemption. He says it in verse 6 in Exodus. He says that he will bring them out from under the burdens and I will deliver you from the slavery to them. We also too have been promised redemption. We've been promised redemption. So Colossians chapter 1, if you'll look, page 572. Page 572. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Just as the Israelites were promised, they were going to be redeemed. That word redeemed means to be liberated, to be set free. A, a deposit was made by God with the, with the Israelites, and it was up to them to redeem it. And so the same thing applies to us. The deposit that we see here is Jesus Christ himself. Think about it like this. When we moved here, we had to pay a deposit to where our apartment is at. If we didn't pay that deposit, we don't get to live there. But our deposit enabled us to redeem something, in this case, to be able to live there. The same thing here on a much grander scale is the deposit that we see here that Jesus made was on the cross. He took our sins, the penalty from it, and now the redemption is we no longer have to have that penalty of sin. We no longer have to be weighed down and burdened by the sin that we once had. Now, we're still sinners, but it's not on us, it's on Jesus. So that's the second promise we see here. We see that Jesus has given us the promise of redemption. These are, guys, these are promises that we can hold on to. Hold fast is the word. In other words, don't let go of these. Don't search for something that's not there. Search and hold on to something that is there. We got freedom, we got redemption. And then the third promise he makes to the Israelites is adoption. He says in verse um, 7, he says he's going to take them to be his people. Isn't that beautiful? He's going to take the Israelites to be his people. It's not on the Israelites, it's on him. He has said, these are my people. The same thing for you and I. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, you'll turn, it's on page uh, 566. The same thing that, that the Israelites had, the promise of adoption, is the same promise that we have. This is a promise that God has given us in his word in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, it says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, that's a universal term. You women, you're not out. This is a universal term. It means sons and daughters. In other words, because it's something God did in the past, you and I get to reap of it in the future. So think about it like this. It, Eliza, me and Abby adopted her. Eliza didn't do anything for that. She had no say in the matter. I mean, yeah, we fell in love with her, but she had no say in the matter. We chose to adopt her. Her birth mom chose a different life for her, and we chose to adopt her to give her this better life. God chose you, and he chose me, if you're in Christ, to give us a better life, to give us a Savior, and then Jesus comes in, and it's all because of him. He has adopted us into his family. We can be sons and daughters, not because of anything I did or you did, but because of everything God did. That is a promise that we must hold on to very tightly and not let go of it. And then lastly, we see inheritance. 
In verse 8 of Exodus 7, God says he's going to bring them into this land that he swore to give them. He promised them this land of Canaan. He promised them this promised land. He's going to give it to them. So what about us? So um, Matthew 25, 34. And this is the last time you've got to turn. Matthew 25, 34, page 485. I really want you to see this. And what a good challenge to us could be, what if we were to go home and this week and memorize these promises and memorize the scripture that goes with it? The way we could know it and quote it and say it anytime life comes our way, we might not know the answer to this, but you know what? We know the answer to this. So Matthew 25, 34. Then the king, this is Jesus, then the king, the king is Jesus, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do you get this? God is preparing, Jesus is preparing for us a place to go for the people he's chosen. Remember the adoption. God chose us in Christ, and now he's got this place that awaits us. This is not your home. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is not your home. I love what he says in verse 3 of Exodus 7 or 6. He says that, um, I think it was verse 3, but he, he said that he was going to give them a land, and he called them sojourners. He called Moses and Israelites and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He called them sojourners. In other words, that word means a visitor. God's not preparing this earth for us. Yes, we can have a relationship with here. God is preparing another world for us called heaven. That is the inheritance that awaits us. That is a promise that we must hold on to very tightly. When me and Abby got married, before we got married, I was living with my dad, and she had her own house, and she had money in the bank, and I was broke. I didn't have anything. I was living with my dad. So she didn't have anything. She's got a house. What do you think happened when we got married? What do you think I received because of us getting married? I got her home. The money in the bank, her home, that became mine too. Because of two words, I do. When I said those two words, what became hers became mine. I didn't do anything to get it. Nothing. Only thing that happened was I joined into her. I committed my life to her, and because of that, what was hers was now mine. You see where I'm going with this? When you commit to Christ, when you join into him, what is his becomes yours. What is his becomes yours. That is the inheritance that we're talking about here. This is glorious stuff right here. The inheritance that God has, that Jesus has, and when you commit your life to him, when you join into him, you not only get adopted, you get this unbelievable inheritance. So those are the four promises. I really hope that you'll take that home with you and look at those verses. Freedom, redemption, adoption, and inheritance. So if we were to end on that note, it would be fine. All this is great. If we were to end right there, it would be wonderful. But what if we didn't end right there? What if there was more to this? We're talking about these promises that God promised to the Israelites. We're talking about these promises that God has promised to you and me in and through Jesus. What if there was a way for us to become this promise? Think about it. God told Moses he was going to rescue them from Egypt. At the end of verse, or I'm sorry, in verse seven, verse, chapter 7, verse 6, it says that Moses and Aaron did so just, they did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. God had promised them freedom, redemption, adoption, inheritance. They had to go and do what God was telling them to do. And because that, because they remembered what God had done, believed what he was going to do, and obeyed him, they become that promise. The best way I can describe this is a song that we used to sing in children's church a long time ago. And so, the best way I can do this is just sing it for you. That's right, I'm about to sing. Ready? Here we go. It goes like this. I am a promise. 
I am a possibility, I am a promise with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality, and I am learning to hear God's voice, and I am trying to make the right choice. I am a promise to be anything God wants me to be. I can go anywhere that he wants me to go. I can be anything that he wants me to be. I can climb the high mountains. I can cross the white sea. I'm a great big promise, you see. I told, that was my audition for the band. I don't know if I got it or not. So Moses became this promise because he remembered, he believed, and obeyed. You and I, too, can become this promise. We can become this promise because of what Christ did on the cross. We can become this promise when we remember what Jesus did, when we believe in his fulfilled promises, and when we obey him. We, too, can become this promise. So, as you know, I have a walker I use. I don't know the people that made it personally, but when I ordered it, I was curious because I was about to spend money on this. It was going to help me get around, so I don't want just some, something that's not good. So I started researching it. I started researching to see what, which one I wanted, and I found this one on Amazon. Um, we call it the Excalibur, or Bruce does. So we found the Excalibur on Amazon, and I could have just stopped there and ordered it. I did not do that. I began to read reviews of what other people who had bought it were saying. Now, if I had came across a bunch of bad reviews, I would have went to the next walker. But, fortunately, I came across a bunch of good reviews, so it made me think, okay, this is a good walker. So, I ordered it. I paid the money for it. I ordered it. It came in. And then, I started using it. And as the more I used it and I put my weight on it, the more I trusted it, hey, it did not collapse. I'm a kind of a big guy. I put all my weight on it. It didn't collapse. I've sat on it. It has not collapsed. So I researched it. That built a little trust. I read what other people were saying about it. That built some more trust. And then when I got it, I started using it. And that built even more trust. So how do we go from here and we become this promise? You study God for yourself. Just as I did finding out what that walker was. You study God for yourself. And then guess what? There's a whole bunch of reviews in this Bible about God. Those reviews made my confidence grow in that walker. You're going to read these reviews and it's going to build your confidence and your trust in God because you're going to see what all these other people have been saying about Him. And then lastly and most importantly, you've studied God, you've been reading all the reviews that all these other people have said about Him, and then you start walking with Him. That trust is going to grow, and it's going to grow, and it's going to grow, and you're going to start believing in his promises and believing in his promises more and more and more because you studied, you read the reviews of him, and you're walking with him. So how do you become that promise? How do we embrace this promise? You remember, you believe, and you obey. Let's pray. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to remind you of something that took place here in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. It says that God was going to release or free the people of Israel from the Egyptians with an outstretched arm with acts of judgment. God freed the Israelites. with these acts of judgment. His power was on display. I want you to see with you and I, Jesus has freed us with his arms out on the cross with one act of grace. And that is available to you this morning. That is available to you this morning. If you've never done that, if you've never experienced these promises, if you've never experienced this freedom, redemption, adoption, inheritance that we're just talking about, that is available to you. And it is simple. Jesus himself says, repent and believe. It's not some glamorous, big big words prayer. You believe it in your heart. Recognize you're a sinner in need of a Savior. 
Confess your sins and place your faith in Jesus. It is that simple. But if you need somebody to walk through this with you, there's people um, to the right and to the left at the crosses who would love to listen and talk and pray with you. Or if you want to fill it out on your connection card, we would love to follow up with you about this. Those of you who are in this room, and these promises are yours because you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what if we started remembering these promises and holding on to them and become these promises as we go forward? Suddenly, the trials and the darkness and the, the problems that the world brings to us would not seem as big and unsurmountable because we're holding on to these grand promises that God has given us and we see it in his scripture. So as this time of invitation starts, whatever is prompting you, whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, you respond. If it's praying to yourself right there, if it's knowing that you need to embrace these promises more, you do as God leads. Father, thank you for your promises. May we all hold them near and dear. May we hold fast to them and never let them go. May we become those promises, God, by simply remembering believing, and obeying. May you lead and may you use this time, God, to bring people to you.